What's uh, what simple mistake did Lane make in this first green step? Well, minus negative three, right? Which would turn it into four plus three. Okay. Uh, so it should be four minus negative. Okay. So it is a common mistake. <coughs> How is Lane gonna avoid this in the future? The negative sign with it. Just make sure to carry that negative. There's, it's, you can see how it can happen, right? Because you know that second thing is always minus, and we minus the, the number that we see. And if we forget that that number is a negative number, uh, it's pretty common just to forget, just forget to bring it along. Um, so just pay close attention, unless you have better advice. See, she took uh, 1275 minus 6 over 7 minus 4. <coughs> so she, she did the, the cost in the numerator and the days in the denominator. How does she know that it was supposed to be that way? How does she know it's not supposed to be the other way around? Flipped over. I should write something real quick about that. But because of this, or IDK, something like that. guess would be that you probably just did that, maybe because that makes more sense. How do you know that's what you're supposed to do? How do you know that's what the person who wrote this problem wanted you to do? This uh, little chart here? Yeah. What do you mean they are that way? Days Oh, but this is dollars over days here. Oh. And this is this is days over. So the days are up top and the dollars are about down bottom in the in the chart. But then if you add up with dollars over days, usually it, it gets I don't know, I don't want to answer my own question. Do you have a reason why you wind up with dollars in the numerator and days in the denominator? Well, a lot of times when we have rates of change, we say it happens per day, per hour, per minute, per second, per time period, right? Time usually is in the denominator, okay? So that's, that's typical, but it's this that really tells us, when we say with respect to something else, um, we mean that it's, it's the thing that's, that's changing that's causing the other thing to change. The thing that's in the denominator is, is typically what we call the independent variable. It just goes along, time just moves along, nothing's 
making it go along, but as it goes along, it causes this other thing to change, the dependent <coughs> variable. How much it costs in dollars is dependent on how many days have gone by. So that with respect to time, you could just interpret that as being the denominator. Underlying phrase with respect to that tells us that's what we're supposed to do. Um, so we got this number 225. What does it mean? The rate of change per day. The rate of change, yes, per day. Per one day, 225 is the amount of changes. Uh, so rate of change per day. A rate of change of what? The cost in dollars. Cost in dollars, rate of change in cost, that's in dollars. So it costs you 225 per day to what, if you remember this problem? What is the cost for doing what? Turn our homework. Is there any questions from the homework? So this was a, a challenge from the last section that uh, I wanted to work out together so that we could uh, maybe make some sense of the slope of something and the rate of change of that thing. Right, so these are all containers. They can hold stuff. And uh, there's just three separate scenarios. In each scenario, they're being filled with some kind of a liquid at a constant rate. Okay, So they're just pouring out a steady amount from some container into these containers. And uh, we want to graph the height of the liquid versus the time. So what I want you to do in this first one, I do want you to do it uh, individually in your notes. Uh, this axis would be the height, and this would be the time. And so I want you to draw a graph of what you think it would look like, what would the, the uh, that would, would it be a line, would it be a curve, what would it look like, what would be your guess? Would it be constant, would it be straight?
straight line. He drew it as a, a straight, a diagonal line. We gave it some kind of a change in the shape, like maybe some kind of a curve. Okay, so it looks like other people can even raise their hand. We all drew that as a straight line. Let's say that's after one second. Okay. After another second, how do you think the height will have changed? If this took one second to fill up this much, where do you think the height will be after another second? Twice the amount. Twice the amount. It's a, it took one second to fill up this much, so it must go up the same amount after another second. After another second, it should go up the same amount, and the same amount, and so on. So the height of this liquid is going to change at this steady rate. Okay. What would we have to change to cause the height to change about the scenario to cause the height to go up more quickly or to go up more slowly? Rice? Um, maybe if it's wider. Okay, if it gets wider. Let's let's leave the shape of the container the same. And what would we have to change then? Um I'm not sure. Change the rate at which it's being filled with the water. Yeah. It's being filled, we we'd have to pour more quickly and more quickly to get the height to rise faster or slow down to slow down. So uh, the only thing that can change it is how fast we're pouring the water in there. So the the shape should be like that. As some amount of time goes by, the same amount of height will be gained. Okay? So I want you to do the same thing for this one. And uh, try to yeah, approximate about what it would be like. shortly after we started filling it up. Let's 
So how quickly is the height going to be rising at the beginning? <coughs> Can't say exactly, but we kind of compare it to the rest of it, right? <coughs> Not very quickly if we compare it to what's about to happen, right? As it gets more narrow, what's going to happen to the height? The, well, it's going to fill in the height is going to increase uh, more quickly, more quickly, more quickly. From here to here, let's say, we'll get some increase in height. If we go the same amount of time, though, what should we? Should it just be twice as high after that, or should it, you know, have less of an increase, more of an increase? More of an increase. More of an increase. It's getting thinner. So the, the narrower the container, the, the less it can hold, and like the more it has to be <coughs> put towards going vertical. So we're going to see, you see this much of an increase from here to here, you see this much increase in height. So for the same amount of time, we should see not double the height, but a little bit more than that, because it's getting narrower. And after that, it gets narrower still. And it's going to fill up faster, or not fill up faster, but the height is going to increase faster and faster, okay? Faster and faster, let's say we get to there. But what's going to happen when we get right here? Is the height going to keep rising faster and faster and faster as we get to that, that neck of the thing, the flask? How's the height going to increase once we get there? It's going to stay the same. Whatever it is, it's going to be pretty fast because it's really narrow, right? But it's the same kind of shape as this one. This is a, a cylinder, and it's a constant uh, width, diameter. Uh, and so we should see the increase in height be constant throughout here. It's fast because it's so narrow, uh, but it's not going to be like the height's going to change, but how fast the height is rising is going to stay steady, right? The slope of this graph should stay steady. So this comes up like this. It's filling up faster. It's uh, the height is rising faster and faster and faster. But right here, when we get to the neck of this, if you call it a flask or painter, I guess, then it'll just keep filling up at the rate. Uh, that what it, like whatever this left off at. So it's gonna increase faster and faster and faster and faster. Then when it gets to the neck, it'll just carry that steady, that really quick, right? Big slope, steep slope means we're, the height is changing really <coughs> quickly, uh, but it's a steady change, okay? So what we're wanting to take away from this is that however steep the graph is, what does it tell us about the situation? What does it tell us about the height, the steepness of this graph, or the slope of the graph? Got it. Not very steep right here, and really steep right here. So how do those less steep parts of the graph compare to the more steep parts? Here is the height changing quickly or slowly compared to the rest of the graph? Height changing quickly or slowly here? Quickly. Right here? Oh, slowly. Slowly, right here. How do, so we can look at the, the container itself. Why did, what about the container itself tells us that the height is changing slowly? Because it starts out like really wide. Really wide. So it, they can hold a lot of water in this really wide area, right? So as we're filling it up, they can take a lot of that volume and spread it out. So the height's not going to change as much as it will for a narrower part of it. Okay? So it's not filling up very quickly. We see the slope is not very steep. It's not a very big slope, right? Um, the slope is probably even less than one. It doesn't go up one and over one, it goes up maybe up one and over two, something like that.
like that. It's not very steep. Okay? But over here, is, it, is the height changing quickly or slowly here? Quickly or slow? Yeah? Quickly. Quickly. Okay? We can change, see from the, the picture that it's changing quickly because it's getting more narrow. And the graph, the thing about the graph that tells us that it's changing quickly is what? What about the graph tells us that the height is changing quickly? This graph here, the graph. What about the graph tells us? Okay, so you're comparing, like, we only go up this much, just a little bit, in this amount of time. But over here, we, we go up that much, which you're comparing the verticals, and we don't have to move over as much. Move up the same, but over just a little bit, compared to over here. Yeah, and that's slope, right? Vertical versus horizontal, that's slope. So the ratio of vertical to horizontal is bigger. There's more vertical versus horizontal. If we compare the horizontals, it's the, it's the same. If we look at the same amount of time, we change a little bit vertically and move over horizontally, say, one second. If we're moving over one second from here to there, our vertical is huge comparatively to our horizontal. Okay? So big slope means a fast rate of change. This last one. Again, tight and time. Maybe to help us see exactly what's going on, the the, the volume is changing at a constant rate. Okay? And uh, so what I've done is, is laid this sideways so that we can compare what's happening at this time, like how fast is the height changing, uh, how fast is the height changing here, or, yeah. So um, this help, helps give a, a reference point to, to what time we're talking about. So from, from here, from the beginning, where we don't have any uh, liquid in here, to where we're up to this point, okay? How fast is the height changing? Is it, is it changing comparatively quickly or slowly? Slowly. Slowly. Why slowly? Because the object is getting wider. So it's getting wider. So is it changing more quickly here or more quickly here? Quickly right there. Quickly here. Yeah. And not as quickly over here. Or uh, no. Quickly way. there. Quickly here. And then as it gets higher, it's slower. Okay, slower. Okay, so the, the height is going to change more slowly. So what should I change about the graph? If the height's going to be raising more slowly, what about the graph should be changing? The line will be as steep. It'll be steep or not as steep? Not as steep. So it'll be steep to start with and then not as steep after a while. Yeah. It'll get less and less steep. Its slope will be smaller and smaller and smaller because it's filling up more slowly as we do this, right? If we were to maybe move this out of the way for a second, it's gonna fill up quickly and then more slowly and slowly and slowly as we as we hit the wider part. And then it'll speed up and get faster and faster and faster and then more slow again, right? So it'll be, it'll start off kind of fast and then it'll kind of slow down, okay? It'll kind of slow down. Then we get to here, 
this seems like a pretty important time, right? What's happening right here? It starts to speed up. It starts to speed back up because the thing is at its widest diameter, right? So it should speed back up. The, the height should uh, speed back up. And probably about here, it'll be changing as quickly as it was back here because it looks like it's about as wide here as it was there. And after that, what's going to happen as we get to this part of the container, the base, or whatever? What's going to be happening to the height now? It'll go a lot faster. A lot faster. And it'll just keep getting faster and faster and faster. And it slows down. And then it slows back down because it's getting wider. Mm -hmm. Okay, slower. And this will be a little bad. So it starts out fast slows down, right? You see how it's really steep here and not as steep here. It's it's its least steep, hopefully, right here. Because this is about where it's gonna be filling or the, the height is gonna be changing the slowest. And then it speeds back up and then it gets even faster and faster until it gets to here where it'll be going its fastest and then it'll slow back down. Connection between the slope. There's a connection between the slope. That's the thing right here. Should be double-headed arrow here. The slope and rate of change. Rate of change of this with respect to that. This would be the numerator and this would be the denominator. Rise over run. So now we're to 4.6 and uh, not real heavy stuff. Uh, what I think is a, a nice, easy first day back. Okay. Um, go ahead and please write the equation I'm asking for right up there. So if you want to write an equation or a formula or a, you know, a function to represent the situation, all you have to do is think, if I'm going 75 miles an hour, um, and I want to know how far I've gone after two hours, what would I do to calculate how far I've gone after two hours? Seventy-five miles an hour. It says in the speedometer. You do that for two hours. How far have you gone? One hundred and fifty. How'd you do that? Multiply seventy-five by two. Okay, so in every that's what inherent in the in the statement of <coughs> the rate of change, seventy-five miles per hour. Saying per hour, every hour, you're going seventy-five miles. 
So if you're going for two hours, you must have got 75 miles and another 75 miles because you went for two hours. So you'll multiply that by two. Two. How about after four hours? Bryce? 300. 300. How did you do that? Imagine I were to say how far have you gone after five hours, what would you do to find that out? You don't have to do it, what, what, what would you do? Multiply 75 by five. So an equation would be like, I'm giving you instructions on what to do. Given a time x or a time t or a time whatever, uh, Here's what you would do with that time to figure out how far you've gone. So they give you time x, and I'm giving you three different times. Three different times. What are you going to do with that time to figure out how far you've gone? Cameron? If I were to give you a time right now, what would you do with that time to figure out how far you've gone? Well, for two hours, what would we do? Two hours, times 75. times 75, four hours from 75, five hours times 75. If I were to give you times six, times seven, times eight, what would you do with that time? Multiply 75. Multiply. Yeah, times whatever it is, right? So the thing that we use to represent whatever time it is, it could be x to represent time. Or if we don't like x, we want to use t, because time starts with t. We want to use H because we're talking about hours and hours starts with H. Whatever you choose. Whatever that time is, you'll take 75 and multiply it by that time. And that'll be your distance. D for distance. So we've got a, a rate of change right here. And if 5 hours goes by or 300 hours goes by, I'm just going to multiply that by 75 because that's how many hours or how many miles I'll go in uh, each hour, and that'll tell me the total distance. <coughs> so we're done that one, given the experience we now have from the previous problem. If you're making 835 an hour and you work for five hours, if you have a calculator, an hour, or maybe you could pay for eight hours. So how, how much money are you going to make after five hours? Zero hours, zero dollars, one hour, 835, two hours, 1670, and so on. Just multiply it together. So what equation could we use to represent this to tell someone, here, this is what you do if you want to figure out how much money you've made? What could an equation look like? So no matter what variables we use.
8, 35, T. Make 8, 35, the amount that you make per hour. W is, what are we going to do with that to figure out the area of this rectangle? Let's see if we had it. Checked. I gave you W, what are you going to do with W to figure out the area of the rectangle? Multiply by 4. Multiply by 4. So what, what equation could we write to represent this? A equals 4 times 4 W. But put the 4 next to a, a, a variable, we're assuming that it means multiplication. So 4w, whatever w is, whether it's 2 or it's 85, we multiply by 4, that'll give us the area. Okay? Do the same thing with the triangle. The area of the triangle. That, that number, there's an 8. There and there's a B. I saw something on, on several uh, of, of your work, uh, several people's work, that I want to talk about. So, I um, saw some of this. Um, and I like to just think about stuff like this. Could, could 8 times this length be the area of the triangle? Or Maybe another question is, what would 8 times B give us? Give us the area of, of some shape. What shape would it give us the area of? A square. Well, a rectangle. A square guarantees they have the same length size. So it would give us the area of a rectangle, a rectangle that is 8 high and B wide, or has a B, uh, a base of B. So this is what we have here give us the area of that rectangle. And B. What will give us the area of the triangle? So the area of a triangle in general is one half base times height. Okay. For us, when we have base is B and the height is 8, that's a given. Can we 
maybe shorten this up a little bit. Put it together somehow. B times four, or just because we're used to writing numbers first and letters second, four times B, B times four, it's all the same thing. Because multiplic multiplication is uh, what we call commutative, which means we can switch these two. We could do one half times eight times B, and one half times eight is four, or four times B. So there we have them. We've got these four equations. So that was to, to help you uh, understand equations and some simple equation writing. But what we want to do with these is uh, I'm going to group them together and notice what they have in common. Okay, and. Um, these kinds of equations are the kinds of equations we're going to be talking about on 4.6. Uh, and they're, they're pretty simple. What do all these equations have in common? It's similar among all of them. Multiplying a number by a variable. Is that, do they have all that in common? There are lots of different ways that equations could look. You could add numbers, and we could divide, and we could do all sorts of different things. But every one of these is just a number times a variable. That's it. That's all these equations are made up of, right? That's all there is. That's all there is. have a number times the variable, and that's all. No plus anything, no minus anything, just looking like this, basically. Uh, y equals a number times the variable. Well, this is a, a constant. It's a number. Okay. 
X and Y are variables like we're used to, and A is just that number that you're multiplying by. Here A is 75, here A is 8.35, here A is 4, here A is also 4. Okay. So this is what we call direct variation. Okay. The thing about direct variation, if, if let's think about it as, as time, if zero time goes by, then we have zero. We're at the zero distance. We have zero dollars. If the width of this rectangle was zero, we have zero area. If the base of this triangle was zero, we have zero area, right? So that's that's the thing about direct variation. If we're at zero, we have zero output. As we move forward, we get output. All right. Um, if you were to graph one of these, what do you think all the graphs of all direct variation equations, what do they have in common? What makes you say standard? Do you remember what standard form? Um, so just like you have, you got something, right? Yeah. Isn't it just like what? Um, basic equation, I guess. Or uh, yeah, it is pretty basic. I guess standard has a more uh, specific definition. Um, it is pretty common. At least equations of lines to be written this way. Uh, let's say that we were to notice this looks like y equals mx plus b. Right? Doesn't it look kind of like that? It's kind of like that. If we have a direct variation equation just like this. So, if you were to graph this equation, even without knowing what A is, what, what can we say about any equation that looks like just like this, just like one of these? What could you say about the graph? If you were to graph it. If it is in slope intercept form, if it is y equals m. Starting at point A. Point A is there's a direct variation equation and it's in, you can notice it is in slope intercept form. Point C that I want you to go to, so we're skipping over point B, I'm expecting you to connect these, these dots here. Point C is what could you say about the graph? Okay, I do want you to make some observations between. I'm not going to hold your hand and walk you through every step of the way. You can look there. If you don't remember slope-intercept form, you can go back to your uh, to your notes or to that part of the book or whatever it takes. There is something you can notice about this and then apply to the graph. Yeah. It'll be a straight line. That's true. It will be a straight line because it is in the form y equals mx plus b. So uh, it's noteworthy. Okay. It will be a straight line. Is one other thing that uh, I want to get at. Okay, so I think of it as y equals mx plus b. If you want, you can work out 
that's what they did. Graph this, graph, and graph. This one, graph, this one. Graph as many as you want. Graph all those. So imagine graphing all of them. And they all, they're definitely going to be different in some ways, but there is one way. Say go through, go through where? The origin. It's going to go through zero zero, right? And we we just talked about that. When you have driven for zero hours, you'll have gone zero distance, zero 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 x zero y. When you have worked for zero hours, you'll have made zero money, zero x zero y for the origin, zero zero. Uh, when the width is zero. You have zero area, zero, zero. Zero base, zero area, zero, zero. It's going to go up to zero, zero. If this is the, the way a direct variation equation looks like, uh, then there is no B, or it's not really not a B. A B is equal to what? B is equal to what? Y-intercept. B is the y-intercept, and in this case where uh, we have y equals just a times x and nothing else. What's b in these equations? What's b equal to? What number is it equal to? Zero. Zero, right? It's there, it's just worth zero. Okay. So, goes through the origin. Okay. The graph of any direct variation equation will go through the origin. So, if you have your books, we're in 4.6. Um, and in 3 through 8, I just want you to decide whether Direct variation, or it isn't. If it is, it doesn't have to look like this to start with, but we need to be able to write it like that. Y equals a number times x. Y equals a times x. Direct variation, that's what it looks like. Three is a direct variation or is an encamera? That's it, yeah. Just yes or no is a direct yeah. variation. Yeah, okay. So if a direct variation looks like y equals a times x, then what's a in number three? Bring it back to this slide right here. So y equals a times x. 
is, uh, is what a direct variation equation looks like. So A is the number that you're multiplying by x. So what, multi what are you multiplying by x there? Where number three is. What number is being multiplied by x? What? Yeah, one. So in this case, a equals one. Okay, four. Uh, is this direct variation the same? Is number four that direct variation? Um, No, why not? Because isn't there's a minus one in there also? Because there's a minus one. Right. Direct variation is just a number times x. Okay. When we put in zero for x, we should get zero for y. But if we if we did that for number four, we would get negative one. Okay. So number five, is it direct variation or not? two x, y equals negative two x plus three. Is that direct variation? No. No, it's not because we need to have a plus zero here always for direct variation. So this is a no. Point number six. How did you, how are you sure of that? Because it's a zero, zero, so you can just move things around, I guess, so okay. it's... How are you going to move things around? I haven't thought about that yet. You want to get y by itself. Add x, or subtract x. Subtract x, so we get negative 3y equals 0 minus x, that's negative x. That cancels, we get y equals a negative, but if a negative is positive, so you got one third times x. x over three, one third times x, do the same thing. Well, that's direct variation, isn't it? It's y equals a number times x. y equals a times x, one third times x. So, kind of redundant, maybe. Well, what is a? One third is the number that we're multiplying by x. But uh, what Sarah said was a really good point, too. If, if all direct variation equations uh, go through the origin, then we should be able to put in 0, 0, right? x is 0, y is 0, and that should solve the equation. That should satisfy the equation, and it does. And as long as we're sure this is a linear equation, which since, uh, well, yeah, it's, it's a standard form of a linear equation. Yes, it is a linear equation. It does go through the origin, so it must be direct variation. The way direct variation equation works when you graph it. Um, number seven, but we also want to be able to tell what A is. Is that direct variation, first of all, yes or no? Yeah. Because? Because the zero, you don't even have to like look at the zero, and all you know is you have the x and the y. Two, so you can combine the a and the two, get the x, and then get y by itself. Well, not in like that order, but okay. you have all the things you need for the equation. You have all the things you need to be able to write it in, in yeah. y equals form, and then it'll be just something times x, right? Or uh, what you said earlier, we can put a zero for x and zero for y, and that will be a true equation. Uh, See if we start by subtracting 8x, dividing by 2, and a is negative 4. Okay. 
So the real true test of whether or not we have direct variation is y equals a times x. Can you write it that way or can't you? If you can, it's direct variation. If you can't, it's not. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go back to that again. When we say that uh, x varies directly with y or y varies directly with x or x and y vary directly, we, we use these words vary or variation and direct. It means that y is equal to a constant times x. That's what it means. It's the definition of direct variation. So if I were to tell you that y and x vary directly, <coughs> um, like in number 29, if y varies directly with x, this is what it's telling you. First of all, what does that mean? If y varies directly with x, what does that mean? So we just talked about on the previous page that said that this is what it means when y and x vary directly. When you use those words, this is what it means. What does it mean? What does the equation of a direct variation look like? All equations of direct variation look like y equals ax. If we're looking at 29, when it says y and x vary directly, you know what it means. Y can be related to x in this way. Y equals a constant times x. If I say that x equals, as I said, 3 y equals 9. So given that y and x vary directly, and we're telling you that x is 3 and y is 9, can you find the equation that relates x and y? The equation tells you to take x and do this to it, and you'll find y. We multiply x by 3. So you knew that you have to be able to multiply x by something to get y, and x is 3 when y is 9, so 3 you take an x multiplied by 3, and you'll get 9. Um, a little more complicated. That's 37. For 37, y and x vary directly, so we still have to be able to write this equation, y equals a times x. Okay. Now x equals negative 5.2 y equals 1.4. So number 29, we were able to do it mentally pretty easily. Now mentally, it's not so easy. times x. Okay. I think you're right there. I see this got a little bit mixed up. To test it, let's see if we can take our x and get our y. 
And so if we take x, negative 5.2, and multiply by negative 7.28, just quickly estimating negative 7.28 times negative 5.2, we're going to get 1.4. So you took one point? Wait, what did you do? I took 1.4. Uh-huh. So you did that, and that gave you 7.28. Uh, slightly different. I can't remember. <laughs> okay, remember what you did. Um, I think if you do it again, 1.4 is okay. Oh, I multiplied. Oh, you multiplied, okay. So, um, but this is correct, and to, to help us see why that's correct, let's uh, take a look here. We know that they relate this way because we know it's a variation. So we know that we should be able to take negative 5.2, Multiply it by a, whatever a is. If we want to multiply this together. What should we get when we multiply this mystery a times negative 5.2? Negative 5.2 times 5.2. What should we get when we multiply 5 point, negative 5.2 by whatever a is? Okay, we should get the we should get the y that we were given, we should get 1.4. So if we should be able to take this times whatever this a is times 1. and get 1.4, then we could just solve for a, divide by negative 5.2, and we get exactly what Alexis told us, 1.4 divided by negative 5.2. So a is equal to 1.4 divided by negative 5.2, and give us about negative point Fifths over times negative five over twenty six multiplied by the reciprocal fives cancel negative seven over twenty six so we have a nice exact fraction so the equation would be y equals negative seven over twenty six. x and y vary directly, or they're related by direct variation, or uh, however they word it. We know that we have to be able to write y equals a times x. So if we want to write the equation, we've got to find a. So we could just fill in x, fill in y, and then divide y by x and find out what a is. Um, y equals a times x. We're going to figure out what we multiply x by to get y. And I think several of you have figured out what to multiply y by to get x. Um, the thing that will ne never fail, if you're trying to figure out what a is, you know what y is, you know what x is, you can just plug those in. Negative 5 equals a times 15. You got to figure out what, what is that that you multiply 15 by to get negative 5. Well, to do that, we all, all we have to do is solve for a. 
negative 5 over 15 equals A, or negative 1 third. So A is negative 1 third, which means Y equals negative 1 third times X. Just put it right in there. We saw a lot of negative 3s, because probably you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, what do I have to multiply by? Uh, negative 5 times negative 3 is 15, so negative trying to get from x to y, though. Um, and if we were to solve a bunch of these over and over again, y equals a times x. We plug in y, we plug in x, we solve for a. What are we going to do to solve for a here? Take a by itself in this equation. We have a times x. We want to get a by itself. We want to cancel out that x. How are we going to cancel out that x? Problem. We had x was 15. We did it in this previous problem where x was negative 5.2. In both of these cases, we did the exact same thing. How are we going to cancel out this x? Divide by whatever x is, just divide by it. Divide by x, that's going to cancel out the x. So a should equal y. <coughs> so if you know y and x very directly, you want to find a. You should Y, divide y by x. We did that here, divide y by x, divide negative 5 by 15, we'll get negative 1 third back to where a should be. Well, go ahead and call it good. Remember when you're graphing these, these are all going to have, they're all y equals mx plus b. Uh, they're all going to have a y intercept of 0. They're all going to go to the origin. 